hey, it's been almost a year since my last video about my Alpina B3. In that video, I gave an overview of the car and my plans to import it to the US from Germany. Uh, since that video, I've moved back to the US and the car did reach 25 years old, so I completed the importation process. Um, when the car arrived uh, back in July uh, in the port of San Francisco, I basically bought a one-way ticket up to San Francisco, brought with me a battery jump pack and a portable tire pump, uh, went up there and went to the port to uh, pick up the car. Um, it was a little bit of an ordeal. There wasn't great communication with the folks at the, uh, at the, at the storage yard with the import manager and I couldn't get in touch with the import manager so I basically had to convince someone at the yard that I belong there and I was there to pick up my car and they basically just gave me the keys. Uh, so it was a little scary but I was able to get my car. Uh, it was quite dirty and it was parked next to a pretty cool Mercedes uh, coupe which I didn't know too much about but I think afterwards after I met, showed uh, folks some pictures they mentioned how special of a car it was. So it's too bad I didn't take any more pictures. Uh, I reconnected the battery, checked to make sure that everything that was in the car was still there. Uh, I had the wheel caps on the car removed because it is a little bit of a trick to get off if you're not familiar with Alpina wheels. So um, I, didn't wanna, I didn't want the risk of anyone damaging the wheels or damaging the wheel caps if the tire went flat or needed to be reinflated. So I left those off. But after I picked up the car, drove to a gas station to fuel up. It's first fuel up in the US with that uh, delicious uh, California 91 octane. And then adjusted the tire pressures and then I was on my merry way. Uh, the drive back from San Francisco to Los Angeles was about six hours. It was quite warm, but the car made it back home with no issues. Once I got the car back to my garage, I did my first wash. Wasn't anything super detailed, but it was just a quick wash and then uh, drying with a drying aid. Did a quick vacuuming of the interior. Uh, and then I was actually off to my first car meet with this car. Uh, it was an ice cream meetup in Pasadena. And I got to run into a couple friends that I knew and some other new folks that I have not met. And the car was quite a hit. Um, so. I think this is the first time many people have ever seen an Alpina E36 uh, touring, nonetheless, in, in the flesh. Uh, and by coincidence, there was also another E36 uh, touring there, but this was a 318, I believe it was, uh, that, that was pretty cool. It was silver with, uh, with, a, with a tow hitch, so pretty cool car. We got to hang out, I got to meet the owner. Uh, we talked a little bit about E36s and, and met some other uh, cool folks at that event. So the next day, I got to put the car up on a lift and started to go through the car. Uh, first thing I noticed, kind of a weeping power steering line. Um, don't know if you can see it here, but the power steering reservoir was leaking a little bit down, and the power steering line was, 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 uh, was very wet. Um, also, the alternator was very squeaky and noisy, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about the alternator uh, in, in, in a bit. But basically, I started going through the car, looking underneath, um, there was some scratches on the body underneath, probably from transport when the car was shipped from Japan to the Netherlands. Uh, that, that's something I knew, but now I got to actually see it up close. So nothing too bad, um, nothing to be concerned about, but I, sh I will probably have to clean that area up and put a little bit of underbody coating just to make sure there isn't any uh, corrosion. Uh, over the next few weeks of owning the car, did a couple things. Uh, first, I installed a third brake light. So uh, since this was a Japanese spec car, it did not come with a third brake light. So I actually had that retrofitted. I, I bought the kit while still in Europe, and I believe it may have been the last complete retrofit kit um, available. That was new old stock. Uh, you can still buy the parts individually, but um, this, this was convenient. It had all the parts. It had the trim. Uh, this plastic piece here, it had the light, it had even the screws necessary to bolt everything up. Um, fortunately, there was no wiring necessary since the car was pre-wired for a third brake light, so that was super straightforward uh, and, and simple to do. Um, I've been rear-ended in the past, and I really don't want this car rear-ended, so that third brake light was definitely a must-have. Uh, must uh, 
after the third brake light, uh, I had to rip out the old radio where I did not have the radio code. So luckily I had a BMW Traffic Pro, uh, a spare one laying around. So that's something I installed here. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, this was a option for European cars uh, and it was never officially released in the US, but there are some units that are floating around in the US that uh, I believe the company is Becker USA that actually offered it and sold it uh, because BMW never officially sold it, but they had a stock of it. So they liquidated it and sold them in the early 2000s, I believe. Uh, I had one in my first E36 and I really enjoyed the unit. So I, when I saw there was another one for sale, maybe about a year or so ago, I just picked it up as a spare. Um, the cool thing is there's a lot of aftermarket Bluetooth modules that you can plug into where the CD changer goes and you basically have Bluetooth connectivity for music uh, on a radio that is 20, 20 plus years old. So that's a pretty cool upgrade to have that looks very OE. Uh, it even says BMW on it. So for those folks who love the, the OE plus kind of modifications, that's something to uh, kind of look at. Um, as I plug the car into the BMW diagnostic tools as well, so this car does not have an OBD2 port, but does have the round BMW diagnostic port right here. Uh, so I was able to plug it in, really read the codes and check what's going on. The car was having a misfire on cylinder number two. So once I started to dig into that, quickly realized the, one of the previous owners in Japan installed aftermarket ignition coils. Uh, Never, I never recommend going non-OEM ignition components on a BMW. You will have some weird ignition issues down the line. So quick thing, replace, put, put new fresh uh, OEM spark plugs and OEM Bosch ignition coils, uh, solve the problem uh, right away. So pro tip, don't go with aftermarket ignition systems on uh, BMWs. Um, next, there was a pretty bad rattle coming off of the exhaust system. So after looking at the car, it was quickly realized all of the rubber exhaust hangers were dry rotted. So replace all of those. Uh, there's still a light exhaust rattle, which I'll have to sort out, but it's nowhere near as bad it was uh, when I bought the car. So that was a quick and easy thing to do. Um, in my journey of continuing to sort out the car, uh, there was a weird smell from the interior. Nothing too bad, but it, it always kind of lingered. So I invested in a carpet extractor and wow, it is probably the best investment for a detailer or someone who's OCD about being clean. Uh, the amount of crap that it removed from the interior of carpet and seats of the car were amazing. So uh, I'll put up some pictures of the, what was extracted out, but Highly recommend a carpet extractor for anyone who loves detailing and, and has non-leather seats. Because uh, these fabric seats, even though they look super cool, I imagine they're going to be a little bit more difficult to uh, maintain and keep super clean. So carpet extractor for the win. Then from an outside cosmetic standpoint, uh, basically did a detail of the car. Uh, so decontaminate the paint with iron remover, um, clay bar the car. And then I spent a couple days just kind of going through the details of the car, uh, doing dual, dual stage polish using um, M105 and M205. Uh, I used my old trusty uh, Porter Cable orbital polisher, so nothing too fancy. However, I did recently add a, uh, a Rupaz Nano to my arsenal of tools and that is probably one of the best investments um, that you can have. It just really lets you get into some of these thin areas like, like the A-pillar, door frames, and then also in this area inside the door handle. It just makes a massive difference. It makes everything consistently shiny, so you don't have any dull spots. Uh, but really between the Rupaz Nano and my uh, Porter cable with a five inch pad, I was able to do the entire car without any issue, get able to get every nook and, and cranny. Um, and then quick upgrade I did was remove the Japanese spec headlights and installed a set of European Bosch uh, headlights with uh, glass uh, covers. Uh, the Japanese headlights actually came with glass as well, but the in insides of the projectors were nowhere near as good as the Euro spec lights. Uh, they were actually more 
closely related to US spec headlights uh, from, from the design. Um, and I was able to install really nice H1 bulbs and makes a huge difference here. I was able, even able to make sure that the headlight adjusters continue to work. So for those of you who are not familiar in non-US spec E36s, there is a headlight um, height adjustment here that allows you to set how, where your low beams are pointing, high or low. Um, this is useful if you have a lot of load in the car and the rear of the car is squatting, or if you're going down or up a, a continuous incline, it just kind of helps you to adjust the light in any way to avoid uh, blinding anyone, uh, any, any, any oncoming traffic. So talking about the alternator, uh, let me get a light so I can show you guys what's going on. So that is not the original Alpina spec alternator. Uh, that's because the original Alpina spec alternator is 115 amps, while stock E36s came with, I believe, an 80 amp um, alternator. My alternator was quite noisy. Uh, I believe it was the rear bearing. So when I attempted to take the alternator out or uh, remove some of the bolts, basically the rectifier, the, some of the electronics in the back of the alternator disintegrated. Uh, so I still have the original alternator. It's in pieces right now. My intention is to rebuild it. However, for me to get the car back on the road, I needed to find a temporary solution. So, and I needed to get it back together that day. So I ran to a local uh, AutoZone parts store and I was able to pick up a, an alternator that fits a regular E36, uh, 328i, 80, 80 amp hours. However, it is not a direct fitment because on, an, on a regular E36, you can see that there is a intake for uh, air to cool the alternator. However, on the Alpina, the intake is actually facing downwards. And the reason why it faces downwards is because of this oil cooler loop that is here. The Alpina M52 engine here uses the oil uh, filter housing from an S50 uh, M3 motor, and there's a provision for an oil cooler, but they're not running an oil cooler, so to close that off, they have this loop here, and that loop actually interferes with the intake for the alternator. So to make a stock E36 alternator fit, all you really have to do is trim that plastic intake for it to clear. Uh, so, so this is a good temporary workaround to keep the car going. Uh, since this is an AutoZone rebuilt alternator, it's not the highest quality and it's still quite noisy and squeaky. So again, my intention is to rebuild the stock uh, Alpina alternator and to put that back into the car here. Since having the car here in Southern California, I've been to a few uh, car meetups and events. Uh, the first big one I went to, besides that ice cream meet where I got to meet a couple, a bunch of cool people, uh, was Auto Conduct's uh, wagon meetup. Um, it was a pretty cool event. I did not realize there were so many station wagon uh, fans out there. Uh, it seemed like they all descended into that event. So it was pretty cool. We had a lineup of E36 wagons um, parked one next to one another, including a super cool E30 wagon. Uh, so got a lot of attention uh, with the, just a line of E36 wagons uh, with, a, with a, a blue 320i, a, uh, Day, I believe it's Daytona uh, 328i, and then my Alpina. After that, the next event I went to was actually the Huntington Beach uh, Concours event. Um, I did not submit my car to be judged because um, I figured, I didn't realize it, uh, but I thought my car would not have been clean enough, but after showing up to the show and seeing some of the other cars competing, I, I, I could have been competitive. And I think others were giving me feedback that I really should have submitted my car to be judged. So lessons learned, don't be shy, just go ahead and submit your car for uh, being judged, even if you don't think it's up to a Concours uh, condition. Uh, I'm very OCD, so I feel like there's just too many things wrong with the car for me to really be competitive. but. Um, it was a really fun event. Got to meet some other Alpina uh, owners. It was a uh, E12 uh, V7 Turbo and a E28 
uh, B7 Turbo as well. So very cool event, got to meet some additional uh, BMW and, and Alpine uh, collectors. Then after the Huntington Beach Concours, uh, the next big event was Car Week up in Monterey. I did a, I, I kind of caravaned up with uh, my buddy uh, with the purple uh, 328i Torn. Uh, we went up to Legends of the Autobahn, super cool event, my first Car Week and my first Legends of the Autobahn. Um, there was a little bit of issue with the venue, so there was a last minute venue change, but ultimately the, meet, the, the meeting and event still happened. Um, again, got to meet very cool people, got to meet additional Alpina collectors, and it was quite entertaining to hear us nerding out on Alpinas, et cetera, so got to make some new friends uh, at that event. Um, definitely an event that I'm gonna be going to on a yearly basis. Then last weekend, the event I went to was the uh, SoCal Vintage BMW Show. Uh, it did not happen last year, obviously, because of COVID, but I did get to attend in 2019 with um, this car, my 74 2002 Touring, and actually won Best 2002 at that event. So going into the event this year, I was hoping uh, to for another win, and ultimately, I it, it actually worked out. So I actually got best of me uh, for this year with this car. And the funny thing is I didn't technically win. Someone else won, but you kind of have to be there in person when they're announcing it for the awards to be given to you. And since the actual winner was not there, they went down the list to number two and I was actually number two on the list. So, so, so you gotta show up to, to win sometimes. So there's one more car event that I'm going to this calendar year, uh, which is next weekend, and that's gonna be uh, Radwood being hosted in uh, Torrance. Uh, it's a basically a car meetup for 80s and 90s cars, and it seems pretty fun. I've never been, but from the pictures, people dress up, so my intention is to dress up in 80s and 90s fashion uh, and to represent uh, this car here. Uh, this is gonna be the last event for the calendar year for me because there's quite a lot of work I want to do to the car uh, in terms of restoration and just other maintenance items that have been deferred or things that are coming due. Uh, so that really I'm going to be spending the next few weeks and months after that show just sorting everything um, out on the car. In terms of my future plans on what I'm going to be doing to the car, uh, I've already begun to organize all of the parts necessary for my big winter restoration project uh, for this car. Um, on the list is a manual swap because the car is Switchtronic. However, I'm very much on the fence on whether to actually do the conversion or not now. Um, I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Uh, I do want to return the car back to stock suspension. So right now this car does have an aftermarket suspension system uh, I'm not familiar with what brand it is. I believe they are Bilstein shocks, but the springs, I can't seem to figure out what brand they are. They are painted or powder coated white. Uh, I believe they are some type of Japanese system. So once I take the system out of the car and return it back to stock, maybe I'll figure it out. And I'll probably be giving that away to a buddy or someone else who has an E36 wagon that maybe wants a little bit of an upgrade. Uh, the suspension is, it, it handles great and it feels very comfortable. However, it's just very, very low and the front lip has suffered quite a bit because of that. Uh, so in addition to swapping the suspension back to stock, I'll be refinishing the lip uh, and, and can just kind of freshening up everything else uh, inside of the car from a suspension standpoint. Obviously I mentioned the power steering earlier, so um, it'll be go through a full power steering overhaul um, I'll be cleaning the intake system, so the idle control valve, throttle body. Um, the idle sometimes is a little bit rough, uh, but so hopefully that will help the idle. The alternator talked about. Uh, the rear subframe and control arm bushings, all of those things. So basically anything rubber in the suspension system, I will be swapping out and, and replacing. Uh, 
I believe there's also a fuel return line that is leaking slightly because because after a long drive and I when I park the car it does smell of fuel from the back of the car so I'm pretty sure one of the return lines is leaking fuel uh, so that will have to be uh, rectified as well the brake lines on the car I believe are also original so 25 year old rubber hoses that's all going to all be replaced the secondary air pump valve um, I believe is also sticking uh, the reason why I suspect that is it makes the pump makes quite a lot of noise it sounds like it's struggling uh, intermittently on cold start uh, I also get a a error code for one of the one of the vacuum valves somewhere along in here so I'll be checking out the secondary um, air injection system just to make sure it's working um, it's not critical for the performance of the car it really just helps with emissions uh, and which is interesting because this system is not necessary for this car however Alpina went ahead and and installed it anyways uh, you know being environmentally conscious this system was standard on U.S. cars with OBD2, uh, but was not standard on um, LCI E36 cars. And the last big thing on my service and maintenance kind of backlog that I need to work through is my failing ABS pump. Uh, so the ABS pump, let me see if I can get it. It's underneath all of this here, which is a little bit hard to see. Ah, there it is. So it's that component with the orange sticker with all those brake lines going in. So my ABS pump, I believe, is going bad. Uh, intermittently, I will get a ABS and ASC light that turns on. And also, my, there's a strange pedal feel and noise that, that comes intermittently when, the car ha, uh, when there's a cold start with the car. So I'm pretty sure it's the flexible ribbon cables inside the ABS pump that is going bad after some reading on the forums. So really the, the repair for that is taking the pump out, opening it up, the electronics of it, opening it up, and then resoldering uh, wires into to replace the, the, the flexible cable. So that's kind of, um, kind of one of the things I really want, I do want to sort out since I do drive this car uh, sometimes as a daily driver. So it would be nice to have ABS, especially in Los Angeles, where there's quite a lot of bad drivers and you may have to react very quickly to something that happens in uh, front of you. So I talked about the manual swap and whether I, and whether I was going to go through with it or not. So my original plan was to swap this over to a six-speed manual, just like a stock V3 3.2. Um, so from the factory, Alpina put in a Getrag six-speed manual transmission in these cars. Um, it was, and, and the unit actually came from a Euro E36. However, Euro E36 transmissions are a little bit hard to come by here in the States. So uh, I decided to go with a E46 M3 unit because it is actually the same gearbox internally. Uh, it just has a different input shaft diameter and the E46 unit has uh, additional provisions for other sensors that are not necessary on an E36. So I was able to find, get my hands on a SMG transmission from an E46 M3, did the necessary work to turn the box into a full manual box with the proper detents. Uh, and then I started to collect the various parts that are necessary for uh, this swap. Um, there's nothing wrong with the automatic transmission here uh, in this car. Uh, it's, it's the same, I believe it's the same mechanical unit as a US E36 M3. However, it has Alpina specific uh, software and, and tuning uh, for the car. Now to make the conversion completely unnoticeable, there are two things that are, there are two things that need to be done to make the conversion not noticeable at all. So first, the Alpina Switchtronic airbag, uh, the, the airbag on the cars with automatic will say Switchtronic. Um, however, an easy fix around that is to just put an Alpina logo over the, um, the stock logo, so that one that does not say Switchtronic, so that's super simple. The other thing that'll be much harder to do 
is the digital gauge that was an add-on on some Alpina cars. Uh, on the Switchtronic cars, the fourth gauge, instead of showing a voltage readout, on the, uh, it will actually show you what gear you are in when you are switching through the gears through manual shifting in the car. Those gauges are no longer available from Alpina. Uh, they have been no longer available for a very long time. They will sometimes come up on the used market, but they are astronomically expensive uh, because everyone bought them up to install in their non-Alpina car in, the, I guess, the, the late 90s and early 2000s. So that's going to be very difficult to source. Um, and so I'll be keeping an eye out for it, but if I end up not doing the swap, then I won't need to make that change. So an interesting note about the electronics of the gauges uh, on the gauge itself, the only difference is the label, whether it says Swisstronic or whether it has a battery icon. Uh, the computer unit that controls the gauges is different. The control unit for the automatic cars will talk to the transmission control unit, obviously, so that way it can have a readout of what gear that you're in while the manual computer does not have that connection and just reads the voltage of the car's electrical system. I have a sneaking suspicion that the electronics of the control unit is the same. So the EEPROM is the same, the hardware is the same, but the EEPROM might be flashed with, or with different software, one to talk to the automatic computer versus the manual one where it's programmed not to talk to the automatic computer, instead just to read out voltage. So um, that'll be an interesting exploration to see whether I can dump the, the, the basically the, the software off of this EEPROM and just poke around and figure out. Now, the fortunate thing is I will have access to a computer from a manual car, so it'll be interesting to dump both of the firmwares from the two chips and compare them and, and see what's going on there. So that'll be an interesting project. I'll have to learn a little bit more about electronics and how to dump firmware from EEPROM, but we'll, we'll, I'll sort that out uh, down the line in, in the uh, future. So again, I'm kind of on the fence right now on whether to swap this car to manual. There's nothing wrong with this automatic transmission. Uh, and I'm going to be getting another E36 wagon in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for more information on that. However, those who follow me on social media already know what car it is. Uh, but once that car comes in, um, I will have a second E36 wagon. This car will be manual. So that is why I'm very much on the fence right now on whether to really bother converting this car into manual or keeping this car as automatic and just having my other car as a manual car, just for a little bit of variety. So there's really been an explosion, it seems like, of E36 wagons showing up all over the place. I guess that makes a lot of sense since they are now 25 years old and eligible for importation to the US. Uh, a few have come online for sale even on some of the popular uh, auction websites. And I have acquaintances in other states that have acquired E36 wagons as well. Um, I've already run into four in Southern California at various car events, and you know, it, since it's a, it is still a small club, we've in instantly become friends. So it's, it's kind of a, a cool phenomenon. Uh, most interesting thing is that I am no longer the only B3 3.2 touring in the US. A few weeks after the arrival of my car, another one was imported by a gentleman in San Diego. He actually reached out to me because of my first YouTube videos uh, and ultimately we, we chatted and, and, and met up. We made plans um, after his car to meet up at my garage, uh, kind of hang out, check out each other's cars, talk about other cars. Then we actually rolled to a quick car meet down in Long Beach. Uh, the crowd certainly went, was very psyched to see not just one E36 Alpina wagon, but two. Uh, so that was, that was a pretty cool uh, quick meetup car meet that we, we drove to, uh, to to show off our cars a little bit and, and continue to meet other uh, car enthusiasts in, in the Southern California region. So in terms of other car stuff going on, so you can see that my 2002 right now is in pieces. Um, 
I had a cracked front subframe where the engine mount was. Uh, so basically this area here, it cracks from just over time the vibrations and, and stresses from, from an engine, especially an engine that makes 50% more horsepower than it did uh, from the factory uh, 40 years ago. So that subframe cracked and so my car has been out of commission for a couple months now while I kind of slowly sorted things out, had other competing projects. But now the subframe has been welded up, powder coated, and I'm starting to assemble it. So hopefully this car might be assembled this weekend uh, and fully operational again. So stay tuned for that. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion my subframe cracked from my time on the Nürburgring uh, because I do remember after my several, you know, after several laps in a Nürburgring, I noticed a little bit more vibration from the engine. Luckily, that subframe arm that holds the engine mount did not completely break off because if it does, your engine's only held on on one side and it'll actually rotate quite a bit and destroy um, your distributor because it will rock upward and smash into various parts of the body. So not good. Uh, so that is why I got very paranoid when I noticed a crack and just parked the car for a couple months while I sorted it out. Over here is my Mercedes uh, S600. So this car is actually for sale. Um, I've owned this car for about three years now, so I think it's time to let it go. I had quite a lot of fun restoring and building this car up. I've spent quite a lot of money, time, sweat, blood, and tears <laughs> sorting this car out. Uh, so I, but I did get to enjoy it. Uh, it made a great road trip car whenever I had to drive to San Diego or uh, Las Vegas or San Francisco. So great car, but ultimately I have too many cars. I need to let them go. So this one's actually gonna be going on carsandbids.com soon, uh, hopefully in a couple days. And I'm hoping the next owner will continue the preservation of this uh, automotive uh, masterpiece. a quick scan of my parts hoarding. So this is the transmission that was that's potentially going to go into the B3 along with the new differential and then just other various bits and pieces that I'm organizing uh, for the E36 project but also just other random things. Oh, I also have a set of Cayman wheels that are for sale. So that's an update on my Alpina B3. I know it's been basically a year since I've provided an update on this car, but I've just been enjoying it, um, doing a bunch of car stuff with it, doing a bunch of car stuff with other cars as well. Uh, so I'm glad I was finally able to get around to providing an update on the car, and I'm lo definitely looking forward to doing just kind of more updates on the car, but also some content on my newest, my latest acquisition that should be arriving here in a couple weeks, which I'm very excited for, and I think a lot of other people are excited for as well. So stay tuned. Thanks, everyone. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the update.